everybody uh, just say a few words first um out of a very difficult time we now have a positive path forward for our screening programs in ireland when i spoke with vicky Phelan about four months ago her request to me was very clear and very straightforward she wanted to know that some good would come out of the extraordinarily hurtful and upsetting situation that she and other women and other families had experienced i promised her that it would and today is an important step in making good on that. Very shortly, Dr Scally will publish a truly comprehensive report that identifies what went wrong, but doesn't just do that. It also produces a thorough set of recommendations to put things right and aims towards an overarching national objective to virtually eliminate cervical cancer in our country. That must be our goal to develop a plan for the reduction of cervical cancers and other HPV-related cancers to near elimination. And you do that through screening and you do it through vaccination. Ireland can and must join with others like Australia in saying that we want to rid our country of cervical cancer. In the aftermath of all of the pain, all of the worry, all of the confusion, this must be our collective commitment to the women of Ireland as policymakers, as medics and as citizens. I want to thank this morning Dr Scally for his incredible work, his dedication to the task at hand and his sincere determination to help us create an even better screening programme. Dr Scally of course worked with three other doctors, with Dr Hugh Esch, Dr Karen Denton and Professor Julia Verne. He also worked with a senior counsel, Mary Rose Geraghty, and a barrister at law, Emer Woodville, and they worked over a four month period. During this time, they reviewed more than 12,000 documents, in fact, nearly 13,000 documents. They interviewed all of the key people and stakeholders regarding cervical check, and he's confirmed to me that anyone he asked to be interviewed agreed to be interviewed. They importantly met with those impacted by the non-disclosure of clinical audit, and crucially, they visited the labs used by our screening programmes, both here and in the United States, to satisfy themselves regarding their quality. The report is absolutely clear that screening is vital, it saves lives and it has reduced significantly the number of people dying from cervical cancer in Ireland. It makes it clear that the labs we are currently using meet quality management processes and it finds no reason that they cannot continue to be used. I have been asked the question, as I'm sure so many of us have, by many, many women since this tobacco commenced. Is it safe to use the labs? If I have my smear taken today, is it safe for it to be sent to the United States? How do I know? That the labs being used are of good quality. Today Dr Scally, an eminent medical professional and his expert team answered that question clearly and that message cannot and must not get lost in the very important discourse that will follow the publication of this report because it is simply too important. I also welcome the positive findings regarding both breast check and bowel screen contained within Dr Scally's report with regard to open disclosure. Let me be clear though this report is utterly unequivocal in stating that the widespread non-disclosure of the results of screening audits was a substantial breach of trust for the women and the families concerned. It caused significant distress and additional suffering. The report finds that there is too much clinical discretion in open disclosure and that policies are weak. It recommends that the HSE's open disclosure policy and that the HSE and state claims agency guidelines on open disclosure should be revised as a matter of absolute urgency. In August of this year, the inquiry has identified that one laboratory, CPL, which is no longer a contracted laboratory, and that's a very important point, had distributed slides to other laboratories to carry out at least part of their screening process. Dr Scally believes this issue needs further examination, which could not be undertaken at the time, and I fully agree with him on that. In speaking with him, he is clear he is not suggesting that this is a patient safety issue, but rather potentially a contractual one, and one which he has not been able to examine. The report points to many, many failings, confused and contradictory guidelines and open disclosure, lack of adequate governance and oversight structures, procurement processes that, whilst legal, require improvement, and data and documents poorly managed. The conduct of my department officials and senior HSE management is also addressed in the report. The inquiry finds no indication that my department was aware prior to April 2018 of the scale and the potential impact of the issues in respect to the handling of disclosure in relation to the cervical check audit process. The report states that it would be unreasonable to expect senior management in the HSE and even more so department officials to have intervened on foot of the briefing notes, which it describes as largely reassuring notes. 
The report also finds no evidence to suggest that a briefing from me on the cervical screening audit was ever prepared or ever took place prior to April 2018, despite some political charges to the contrary. I am conscious uh, in particular today of the women and the families affected who have been awaiting this report with anticipation. I am pleased that a representative group of those impacted met with Dr Scally for over five hours yesterday in Limerick to discuss this report and indeed that a letter and a copy of the report will issue uh, by email where possible from Dr Scally today to all of those impacted for whom he has uh, had contact with and contact details for. All 50 recommendations in this report have just been accepted by government at our cabinet meeting this morning and I intend to return to government in December uh, as per the timeline of the report with a full plan for the implementation of Dr Scally's recommendations. Some of the recommendations that we will now immediately progress on include the establishment of a new national screening committee to advise the Minister of the Day and the Department of Health on all screening programmes, any alterations and audit processes. I intend to have that in place by early 2019. An independent patient safety council, which is not a recommendation of the report per se, but clearly when you read the report, the voice of the patient needs to be greater embedded in our health service. I'll bring forward proposals next month for that independent uh, patient safety council. The report recommends that there be two patient representatives on the new HSE board. We will fulfil that. It calls on us to legislate for a duty of candour, which we're doing on our new patient safety bill shortly due before the Oireachtas Health Committee, I think and hope, this month. <coughs> It calls for a recruitment of a new leadership team for the screening service, including a national director for screening. And it calls on the Medical Council guidelines uh, to be tightened and improved, and indeed for an examination of how the National Cancer Registry interacts with our screening process. Is there a need for that duplication uh, of data? I'm also particularly pleased this morning to announce that Dr Scally has indicated to me that he is happy to play a role in the oversight of this implementation plan so that we have external oversight, along of course with the women and the relatives. And I very much want to take him up on that offer to oversee the implementation, because this is the roadmap to build the screening service we need. So we now have a 170 page expert report, which Dr Scally will publish in the next few minutes and speak to, and speak to you uh, about shortly. He will brief the opposition, he will brief the medical colleges also. It finds huge failings and issues which need to be addressed. I am determined that we will now do this. But I would also suggest that we take the time to read it, that we take the time to consider it, and then we decide how best to proceed. Because the women impacted and their families deserve no less. And Minister, you said that, that there's no sign that the Department is aware of the scale of the, the non-disclosure towards the affected patients. Does it find any fault as to who might have been responsible for the scale of that non-disclosure, or what can you tell us about its findings in that? It finds a system-wide failure, and I don't wish to cut across Dr Scally. I think it's very important that Dr Scally has an opportunity first to speak to his report and I'm very happy to speak to it at length then. I don't want to put words in Dr Scally's mouth or indeed publish his report. I want him to do that himself in the coming minutes. But it, it, it does make it very clear that there was an absolute intention to disclose. It actually refers to the cervical check audit as laudable in terms of its intent. Laudable that you would audit a screening programme. Not a lot of countries do. Audible that you would then try to disclose but not the words of the report, but my words, clearly, utterly botched in its execution. And it talks about a number of, and this will become clearer to all of you shortly, it talks about a number of points where there is contradictory and confusing policy guidance. So where the HSE Open Disclosure Policy says in one place, disclose, and in another place, it gives a degree of choice or discretion in relation to that. It talks about how the Medical Council, similarly, needs to give much clearer guidance uh, to doctors in terms of disclosing. It talks about how there should only be very a very narrow few circumstances in which non-disclosure should be tolerated. You clearly get the impression when you read the report, or certainly I do, um, that a screening programme that was introduced, introduced by, by my predecessors um, for good reasons, that has saved lives and was introduced at a time when the country was financially on its knees, but the decision was still made to introduce it, which was a noble one. Uh, endeavoured to further improve the screening programme, but that the structures and the environment in which it was operating was too weak to deliver on that, and as a result caused significant pain and hurt to people who already had the trauma, pain and hurt of a cervical cancer diagnosis. Are we any closer to knowing today whether what happened to the women involved in terms of their scans being missed could reasonably have been avoided? So I think the process that will answer the individual questions is that done by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. Um, what Dr Scally and his team were asked to do, and have done excellently, um, was visit the labs and decide, are the labs we're using today uh, quality fit for purpose? Uh, can Irish women today, whose smears are going to those labs, be confident in relation to their quality? And he answers that question. 
He also produces within his report an infographic that shows for every thousand women that go for screening, 20 of those women um, on average will have precancerous cells and that the screening program will detect 15 um, of those precancerous cells but that in five cases due to the limitations of screening um, that that could be missed. I've heard people including people like Vicky Phelan talk about the limitations of screening. I think people understand there's a limitation of screening. The difference between a false negative and negligence um, will be a matter for Judge Meenan who's due to report back to Cabinet in the second week of October to determine how best to be established in a non-adversarial manner. Minister, just on the 50 recommendations, how many do you hope to have implemented by the end of the year, and especially I suppose around the new director of the screening service, when will that person be in place? And also you mentioned the outsourcing of outsourcing essentially here. Was the department aware of this or was this something that was kept from the department by the person or the, the company that you had outsourced to? So from my reading of the report, and I'm sure you'll have a chance to ask Dr. Scally, um, it seems that in 2010, the lab in America, this lab that is no longer used, and I think that's really important that we don't conflate labs that are and aren't, the lab that's no longer used and hasn't been used since 2012, that that lab uh, reported a significant increase in the volume of slides, and it decided to use some of its other labs in other locations across the United States. Um, my understanding is Dr. Scally has found no evidence that the HSE had any knowledge in relation to that, or my department for that matter, but that it would have been a matter between the HSE and Dr. Scally. Um, Dr. Scally, I don't wish to speak from, but Dr. Scally uh, has a view in relation to whether contractually that should have happened or not, and he has offered to look at that specifically. Um, he's not raising it as a patient safety concern, but he is saying, look, I managed to visit the other labs, or my team did. We managed to assure ourselves I haven't done that in relation to this, and he'd like to do that. Sorry, in relation to the other recommendations, I think some of these recommendations are, as, as you'll see when you read them, this is a very long to-do list. It's a very significant piece of homework that he's giving us to do and one that we're going to take very seriously. It's going to require an implementation structure. It's going to require, I think, someone external like Dr. Scally. It's going to require the leadership of some patient advocates and indeed some medical colleges. We're going to publish an implementation plan within three months, bring it back to government. And you'll see in the report, Dr. Scally calls upon us to... Um, publish updates at certain intervals. Some of them I think I'll be able to move on quite quickly, like the National Screening Committee, like the Patient Safety Council, like the Patient Safety Bill, which will be debated in the Iraq this session, like the HSE Board, which I hope to have established. I'd like to see the recruitment process for that National Director get underway uh, imminently. Today, and obviously I haven't been in a position to do it until today, today I will obviously write to the HSE in relation to this report. I'll also need to circulate it widely, because there are recommendations uh, for the Medical Council too, there are recommendations for the National Cancer Registry, um, and I think there's also uh, learnings that the medical colleges would like to consider. Minister, is the idea of a full commission investigation off the table for now, or was there any discussion about it this morning? No, it's not off the table. Um, it's, it's on the table. But I think what we're going to do here today is not make any knee-jerk decisions. I think in the past, perhaps in relation to this issue, we have. I think it's very important when you ask an expert to do a huge body of work. He wasn't asked to give a view on a commission, and I don't mean that rudely, but he has, he has given a view. Um, he is a very eminent expert. He's been working on this for four months. He's read 12,800 and something documents. He's interviewed all the key people, and he has a view. He doesn't have a view that nothing more needs to be done, certainly not, but he has a view that an alternative process would be better. The government's position is clear. Uh, the government and the opposition, which has been airbrushed from recent commentary, the government and the opposition agreed in a room in Leinster House that a commission of investigation into cervical checks should be established. The government and the opposition also agreed that it would make sense, because of the seriousness of some of these issues, to try and establish some facts, particularly around the labs, um, so people could have a confidence in relation to our screening programme, and then proceed um, to a commission. We obviously now have the development that was somewhat unexpected, uh, that Dr Scally is saying uh, perhaps a better process uh, should be considered. So what I intend to do is what I would encourage everyone to do, digest the report, that Dr Scally speak to the report, and crucially, meet with the opposition next week or the week after, whenever people feel is appropriate, and also uh, meet, very, very importantly, meet with the patient representatives, with people like Vicky Phelan, uh, Stephen Teep, and Lorraine Walsh. Uh, and, you know, if, if there is a view that a commission is required, a commission will be delivered. But it's about getting this right. And I don't think there's any advantage to today saying definitively yay or nay. Today has to be about Dr Scally's report, letting him speak to the report, letting the recommendations speak for themselves, and letting all of us um, letting all of us uh, decide uh, what needs to happen. It's clear there's a huge body of work to address the failures. It's also clear though, and he talks about this in his report, that some of the theories put out there uh, in relation to the labs and the safety of our programme have been debunked. 
So I think it's important that we let this report be digested and be read. Quite a lot of reading in it and a 170 page report, but it's quite quite dense in areas, a lot of detail, and I think it'll take people a little bit of time to get through. Minister, the confusion over the open disclosure <coughs> guidelines, uh, is that the fault of government, and particularly the Taoiseach, when he went for voluntary disclosure rather than mandatory disclosure? No, I don't believe it is. And I mean, remember, we're talking about a screening programme that dates back to 2008. Um, the Taoiseach's position, my position, the government's position, um, has been quite clear on this. And indeed, Dr Scally's position, that there are some cases, a very limited number, um, where voluntary disclosure may be more appropriate. Um, the government is committed to mandatory open disclosure for serious reportable events, and I've made that clear that serious reportable events will include the screening programmes. We've published the Patient Safety Bill. Um, it's due at the Oireachtas Committee for Pre-Legislative Scrutiny, I think this month, I think on the 26th of this month, um, and I hope that they'll, I, I, in fact I know they'll give it the, the seriousness and the urgency that it requires. And we'll work with the opposition to get this progressed. We'll also go further than the UK in our bill. Um, he calls in his report for a, an individual duty of candour, not just that the organisation, but also that the individual, uh, individual healthcare professional, uh, would have a responsibility to disclose. Because you do, when you read the report, you do get a sense that there was a lack of clarity, a very significant lack of clarity, as to who should disclose. And did you need to disclose? Um, and, and I think when... You know, it's often very straightforward if we get a report and if it says, look, individual X or individual Y did this, whatever they say is, you know, is responsible for what went wrong. When you actually read the Scali report, and as I say, he's done a, an amount of work and read an amount of documents that nobody else commenting on this has, um, you, I think we'll find what is, what is a very complex picture, but with very, very important and straightforward remedies that we now need to take. Is there an understandable sense of frustration out there that the process that the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists is undertaking is taking so long? And does that not to some extent take away from Dr. Scully's reassurances about the fitness for purpose of the labs in America? I don't think it does. I don't think it does because what Dr. Scully is saying today is that the labs being used in America and Ireland, by the way, um, are fit for purpose from a quality management process point of view and that he has no issue with them continuing to be used or the extending of their contract. Um, what the ORCOG process is about is about making sure that if, if women wanted reassurance and wanted an independent clinical review, they could avail of that. Um, that's what it's about. It's a woman's choice to decide whether she does or doesn't want that additional reassurance. And that process uh, is ongoing. It was important to balance um, both time speed with getting it right and learning the lessons from the clinical audits of the past where if these things aren't done correctly. So these things would have all gone through the steering committee, worked with patient representative groups, the Cancer Society to make sure it was gotten right. Um, Minister, just say sorry, but uh, you mentioned there's no findings uh, taken in regard to HC senior management, that they weren't the one giving general briefings. Was it unfair on Tony O'Brien then being completely hounded out of office early by perhaps government and opposition pressure given the findings? I don't, I don't think Tony O'Brien would believe he was handed out of office by government, just to, just to be clear on that, but I, I don't speak for Tony O'Brien. Um, I think, look, a lot, of, a lot of comments were made in a very charged environment, in a very charged environment. Um, those comments have now, I suppose, been scrutinised, not directly, um, but have been scrutinised in terms of the work that Dr Scally has done. I think we were all very eager to get to a process, and this is not a criticism, a genuinely not a criticism of Iraq this committee, as I've served on them, I've served on the Public Accounts Committee, people were discharging their duties, doing their job, as Atisha and I said they had every right to do. But there's always benefit in taking a really sensitive issue out of a politically charged environment and actually asking medical experts, will you take a look at this for us? And I think when they did take a look at this for us, um, I think what they have found, let me be very clear, is significant, significant failure of governance and structures, significant policy failures, but not one individual. Um, uh, you know, so I suppose a debate that became very personalised, um, not just towards Mr O'Brien, but towards many others. Um, but that was taking place, like, let's be, let's be clear, that was taking place against a backdrop where everybody wanted to do all that they could to ease the pain and suffering of people who had their trauma added to on top of already a cervical cancer diagnosis. So I'm happy for the report to be read. I'm sure Tony O'Brien and others will have will have things to say in due course and I'll let and them speak for themselves. Is there is there evidence that harm is done to women as a result of these failings, these catalogue of failings which you have found? Certainly harm was done to women in terms of the non-disclosure and Dr Scally is 
very clear on that, that extra harm, extra pain, extra suffering was added to women who already had cervical cancer, in, in many cases a devastating diagnosis. In some cases, as we know, just to use as an example, because we, we know Stephen Teep and I've gotten to know him well, people whose wives have already passed away, extra pain, extra suffering was caused to them by the non-disclosure. The idea that the health, health service knew something about them or their loved one was meant to tell them, perhaps even intended to tell them, but didn't cause extra pain. And you will see in the report, Eilish, a catalogue of failures, even when people were told, the poor manner in which they were told, the lack of apology, that's very clear. What, what, what the report doesn't find, and I need, to, I need to, I suppose, differentiate, and again, Dr. Scully's more eminent to speak on this than I by far, but what the report doesn't find is that, that you know, it's not about cancer misdiagnosis. He does, fi it's about, he does find that the labs were safe to use. He does find that the labs are continued to be safe to use. The contracts could be extended. So I suppose, but, but there's absolutely no doubt, extra harm, pain and suffering was caused uh, by the non-disclosure. And then I think it's very fair to say, worry was caused for every woman in this country by the last number of months of waiting to know. I got as, as minister, and I'm sure every public rep did, and I'm sure probably journalists like yourself did, and probably in our own lives, we all got asked by, uh, by women, or indeed if you are a woman, we're asking yourself, you know, yeah, is my screening, is it safe where it's going? You know, can I have confidence? Dr. Scally provides that confidence today, I believe, but people have waited a long time for that. And Minister, every time we're at one of these, it's always systems failure. It's always that word, and no one has ever held account. Is that not just like just making the problem worse? Why is not no one held to account? I mean, one doctor probably knew, he didn't say anything. How were they not held to account? I think, and I don't mean this way, I think everyone needs to read the report first to see how Dr. Scally arrived at that conclusion. Like I say, it's the easiest thing in the world to say this person did it or that person did it. And when individuals fail, individuals should be held to account. And this report will go to the HSE, it will go to the Medical Council. They have their own processes for dealing with that. But sometimes the truth is more complex. Sometimes the truth is that people who set out to, in the words of Dr. Scally, do something laudable, had systems and structures in place that saw an absolutely botched job of it. Um, that caused pain and hurt and suffering that I'm sure was not intended to be caused to people. So I think, I think we can't reach, and I have no intention of reaching for the easy solution or the easy soundbite here. We have 170 pages, we have 50 recommendations, we have a man who's read 12,800 and something documents, visited the labs, interviewed all the key people, everyone agreed that he, w that he asked to be interviewed, to be interviewed, has met crucially the women and their families, held meetings in Galway, Cork and Dublin with them, documents all of this in his report. And, and, you know, I'm not the expert on this. Dr. Scally is the expert. And um, when you ask an expert to do something, I think, I think you at least allow the courtesy of that report being published, read and digested. Um, and, then, and then if people wish to critique its recommendations. Okay, folks, thank you very much.